My name is Chip Burkhart, and on behalf of the George A. Miller Committee and the Center for Advanced Study, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's MillerCom lecture. Lectures in the MillerCom series are intended to be of both general and scholarly interest, broad and interdisciplinary in their scope. They are always free and open to the public. The series has existed for about three decades. Over this period, we've sponsored anthropologists and art historians, philosophers and physicists, composers and conservationists, and a great many others. One of my jobs this evening is to tell you about the next lecture in the fall series, and that will take place next Thursday, November 17th. Jonathan Shea, who's staff psychiatrist for the Department of Veterans Affairs Outpatient Clinic in Boston, and the author of a book entitled Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus in America, is going to give a center lecture that's entitled From Troy to Baghdad, Can the U.S. Military Learn from Homer's Epics? He's not asking, will the military learn? But he, the question is, can it? Uh, so that's next Thursday. It's at 4 p.m. The location is room 407 in the Levis Faculty Center. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I do wish to say just a few words about the man after whom this lecture series is named. George A. Miller was a distinguished mathematician. He taught at the University of Illinois from 1906 to 1931. He was internationally famous in the mathematical community, at least, for his work on the theory of finite groups. But locally, on the other hand, he was best known for carrying to an extreme the familiar character of the brilliant professor who is largely incompetent when it comes to dealing with the daily business of the real world. He had done traveling as a young man. He'd studied in Leipzig and Paris. Before coming to the University of Illinois, he'd also taught at Michigan and at Cornell and at Stanford. But once he arrived at the University of Illinois, he scarcely budged again. He is alleged to have taken two vacations in his life. Uh, one of these was his honeymoon to Niagara Falls. On one of his vacations, and I'm not sure which of the vacations it was, he wrote back to a friend saying the scenery was nice, but he wasn't getting much work done. <laughs> he lived with his wife in a modest apartment close enough to the mathematics building so he could see it out of one of his windows, and he never thought there was much need to have any other destinations. And through his retirement, he spent most of his days in a small office on the third floor of Altgeld Hall, and he filled the office with stacks of papers and reprints and correspondence with colleagues. He used a heap of mathematics pamphlets for a pillow for taking his daily nap. The fire department declared his office a fire hazard. Uh, he also had in his office a box full of buckeyes, and for those of you who don't know uh, your botany, the buckeye is a chestnut-like fruit of the chestnut tree, and he fed these to squirrels that he attracted to the window ledge of his office. Now, what none of his colleagues ever really imagined was that this quiet gentleman was not only communing with squirrels and thinking about abstract math, but he was also in touch with a stockbroker. And though he looked for all the world as if he didn't have a penny to his name, at the time of his death, he had an estate valued at nearly $1 million. His wife had died before he did. They had no children. He left all of his estate to the University of Illinois with no strings attached. Today, the George A. Miller Endowment is used to support the MillerCom Lecture Series and also the George A. Miller Visiting Professorships. And thus, a man who in his lifetime was known, I'd say, for the relatively narrow focus of his interest is now the patron saint of a lecture series that's devoted to a wide range of intellectual inquiry. And now with that said, it is my very great pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer who is here with us both as a George A. Miller visiting professor and as a MillerCom speaker. Janet Brown is professor of history of biology at the Wellcome Trust Center for the History of Medicine at University College London. She is a scholar of truly extraordinary distinction. Above all, she is known for her magisterial two volume biography of Charles Darwin. The work has been hailed as the definitive biography of Charles Darwin, and beyond this, it has been called one of the most distinguished of all modern biographies. Now, this, I have to stress, is, is no small achievement, given that Charles Darwin is the single most important figure in the history of biology, 
dozens of biographies have already been written about him, that he left behind him a mountain of correspondence and manuscripts and marginal annotations sufficient to keep scholars busy for years and years. And in fact, scholars have indeed been busy in recent years with this treasure trove of materials generating a vast secondary literature, literature on Darwin that has produced new insights but also new controversies. This particular enterprise is referred to in the profession as the Darwin industry. And it's a testimony to the quality of Janet Brown's work that it has elicited the universal admiration of scholars in this field, which can be kind of a rough crowd, and also the same admiration from thoughtful reviewers everywhere. For those of you who perhaps haven't yet purchased the work, I will tell you that the first volume published in 1995 is entitled Charles Darwin Voyaging, and the second volume published in 2002 is entitled Charles Darwin, The Power of Place. Now, I have to say that that's not all that Janet Brown has done. And these mirror images of travel on the one hand and place on the other relate not only to the life of Darwin, but also to Janet Brown's previous work. See, she initially established her reputation as a historian of science through a very fine book entitled The Secular Arc, which appeared in 1983. The subject of this book is the early history of the science of biogeography, that is the geographical distribution of plants and animals. Now, for those of you who don't think much on a daily basis about biogeography, I'd simply observe that we don't have penguins or palm trees in central Illinois. Uh, part of the year it's too hot for the penguins and part of the year it's too cold for the palm trees. But, there, but all that makes sense. What doesn't make sense uh, when one looks at the geographical distribution of plants and animals necessarily is the way that you don't have, for example, frogs on oceanic, oceanic islands or other strange things that, that uh, scientists, uh, naturalists, natural philosophers in the 18th and 19th century began to think about. And it's the development of this understanding of biogeography, uh, nothing to do with central Illinois, that you'll find discussed in Janet's fine book, The Secular Arc. Uh, and if we were to turn these themes of travel and place on Janet Brown's own biography, I think the following points could be made, at least briefly. Her natural habitat has, for the most part, been England primarily Cambridge and London, though her first university degree, a degree in zoology, she took from Trinity College, Dublin. That was in 1972. Six years later, she received her PhD from Imperial College, London in history of science. She followed that with fellowships, first at Harvard and then at the Wellcome Institute. In 1983, the same year that her biogeography work appeared, she became associate editor of one of the most remarkable publishing ventures of the last century and continuing to the present. This was the Darwin Correspondence Project, a project aimed at publishing the complete correspondence of Charles Darwin. Now the correspondence in question amounts to over 14,000 letters. As of today, I think there are 14 volumes now published, but that's only about halfway through, so this is going to continue for maybe maybe next 20 years. I have to say, when I first heard about these magnificent uh, manuscripts and the project itself, it impressed me as a project of immense fascination, but rather like a cosmic black hole, the sort of thing that if you got too close to it, you'd be pulled in uh, from which you might never reappear, or as an alternate scenario, maybe along the lines of Edgar Allan Poe's descent into the Maelstrom, you would come out again, but your hair would be turned white. Now, neither of these things happened to Janet. Uh, she served as associate editor of that project for eight years, emerging with experience and knowledge that was crucial for her Darwin biography. And at that point, she rejoined the Wellcome Institute as a member of the faculty, and that the Wellcome Institute for History of Medicine in London is really one of the, one of the great centers for history of science in the United Kingdom and really anywhere in the world. As I've indicated, the first volume of her biography appeared in 1995, the second in uh, 2002, and in this she has provided us really with a, a wonderful work where Darwin comes alive on the page, where we see a man whose scientific and domestic lives were intimately interwoven. We find a man whose ideas and practices, his successes and sorrows, his, his local setting and his broader social and cultural context fit together and they make historical sense. 
Darwin did his voyaging in his early years. Later in his life, he attached himself very closely to his country house in Kent. Physically, uh, though not intellectually, he was disposed very much to stay at home. We're extremely fortunate that Janet Brown, after her time well spent amidst the Cambridge archives, has been willing to travel both intellectually and in person. And it's certainly a terrific pleasure to have her with us here this evening. Her talk is entitled Corresponding Naturalists. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming her to the University of Illinois. Well, thank you, Chip. That was a very generous and um, rather special introduction. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be invited to contribute to the CAS um, Millercom lecture series. As we've already heard, it's been endowed by George Miller. And I very much appreciate the kindness and the help and the very stimulating historical chat, talk, discussions that I'm receiving here as, one of, as a member of your scholarly program. And it's also a very particular pleasure to visit Urbana-Champaign for the first time. It's my first time in the Midwest. And I must say, the most striking thing that I've noticed so far, and of course it's all very familiar to you, is the sky. You know, we don't see sky in London. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, of course it's a great pleasure, um, not least because this evening is a welcome opportunity. It's our first um, evening of a two-day program that is celebrating Chip Burkhardt's achievements, both here in the university and in the history of science at large. So I'm just going to say something about Chip that is just as nice as what he's just said about me. Um, as you know, Chip's written extensively on the history of evolutionary theory, and more recently, a big book on animal behavior. He's greatly admired in the profession for deepening our understanding of the ways in which biology has developed in the 18th and 19th centuries and now well into the 20th century with his work on Tinbergen and Lorenz, always dealing with important and pervasive themes. Last weekend, Patterns of Behavior, his book about Tinbergen and Lorenz, won the Susan Abrams Prize from the University of Chicago Press. And I know that's an award that means a great lot to him, a great deal to him. Chip, I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities tomorrow to praise you in the conference that's being held in your honor. But I'd like to say in advance on the behalf of everybody who's here, how much we value your work and look forward to lots more in the years to come. And I'm very glad to be here in person to mark your transition from the classroom and the office to your book line study at home two rooms already, I gather, and moving very fast into the downstairs, yes? So, correspondence has always been a very important aspect of the historian's equipment. This is um, an illustration from the Vermeer, of course, as you all know, letters take us into the inner lives of individuals more vividly than perhaps any other documentary record, opening up the world of the past as it was actually experienced, not just in supplying practical information, although that is very important, but also in relation to domestic feelings, the emotional engagement with creative projects, the difficulties of daily existence, business matters, private matters, as we probably see here, and the personal bonds of the society in which the letter writers lived, an insight across the centuries that help us get behind the ringlets, as one reviewer said about a um, uh, recent Elizabeth Barrett Browning biography. Authentic detail from letters can transform. We'll never know what Vermeer's woman reading a letter thinks, but who could resist Jacqueline Kennedy writing to Margot Fontaine after Fontaine and Nureyev had performed at the White House, in which the First Lady admits that, I trod on Rudy's toes during a soft shoe shuffle after dinner. Or Thomas Henry Huxley, 
the, the scientist, Thomas Henry Huxley, experimenting with the newly invented fountain pen in the last decades of the 19th century, saying that it didn't help his handwriting, but at least it spelled properly. <laughs> Those of us who work with large collections of historic correspondence feel extremely lucky to get to know the people of the past, the writers, their friends, and their daily lives almost as well as the people did themselves. And correspondence also offers the prospect of reconstructing networks and patterns of sociability, and it's this aspect that primarily concerns me tonight. For letters do more than bring news. They are part of the actual structure of literate societies. They can offend or delight, are private or public, are essential items of governance, business, and international diplomacy. They can be anonymous, sent with the intention of causing trouble, can comprise a bribe or a threat, or in themselves constitute a gift by offering some unknown piece of information. And letters can kill, as the recent anthrax incidents indicated so dramatically. They can be burnt, thereby leaving historians guessing, or interrupted in their progress. Um, an illustration here from the early 19th century that is titled, One Peep Was Enough. And the notorious 19th century forgeries by Vrain Denis Lucas of letters from such luminaries as Cleopatra, Judas Iscariot, Joan of Arc, and Dante, all written in modern French. <laughs> Duped the brilliant, it's another brilliant but unworldly, unworldly mathematician, Michel Chazel, into claiming that Pascal had discovered gravity before Newton and led to a humiliating controversy from which he never recovered. And I've often wondered if George Miller knew about those forgeries, which played such a big role in the history of French science. And letters, just to continue my theme, can contribute to all encompassing cultural fictions, such as letters to Santa. Most of all, and sometimes easiest to forget, correspondence in the past was the main artery of finance, business, and commerce, as shown by Iris Arrigo in her analysis of the development of a mercantile economy in 14th century Tuscany. So essential to the running of daily life that it required the development of supplementary professions of scribes and messengers. Here I'm just showing an illustration of a Coptic Christian woman dictating to a scribe in Cairo um, a recent book by William Dalrymple published in Britain, I, I don't know if it's out here, about the, uh, it's called The White Mughals, about uh, European diplomats in India, has a very interesting case in which um, a real diplomat seduces a member of the princely harem by writing to her in Persian through a scribe, which was the only one of the six languages that she could speak that she could also read. Um, there's a rather more up-to-date illustration taken from the web, and so I'm afraid it's a little bit um, pixelated, of a clerk. The profession of clerk uh, emerges in sequence with the development of mercantile economies from the Renaissance onwards. Very essential to have these individuals who can write or who take messages. For much of history as well, letters were the usual way that patients consulted their physician and medical advice was similarly returned in letter form, sometimes enclosing a second letter for an apothecary bearing what would come to be known as a prescription. Uh, this is a, um, a Victorian physician, uh, of course, a posed picture, but it is based on a real figure uh, with a letter from his patient in his hand. Employment and apprenticeship depended on letters of recommendation. And last but not least, letters were often, perhaps usually, intended to be forms of public address. Early letters were meant to be read aloud, 
or passed around a wider group of recipients. This engraving from the 1830s is, in, is titled News from Abroad. And you can see how the letter is not just for one person, it's for a number of people. Travers, travelers' letters were often collected to be published and scientific information was communicated and printed in the form of letters to academic institutions. And even today, the tradition still holds with people writing letters to the editors of newspapers with the intention of making their views public. Watson and Crick, for example, announced the structure of DNA in the form of a letter to the uh, scientific journal Nature in 1953. The tradition still continues. And as the novel rose to prominence in the literary world of the 18th century, letters increasingly featured in their pages too. Usually introducing significant turns in the plot or structuring the narrative itself with one letter responding to another letter. A brilliant literary device that draws readers into the mind of the individual letter writer long before Freud and yet lets us, the reader, stand outside the unfolding sequence of events. Brought to a peak by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but also much in evidence in the stories of Wilkie Collins and more recently, A.S. Bayard. So whenever someone puts pen to paper to write a letter, they're entering into a relationship, an imaginary agreement, if you will, bound by context-dependent conventions that hold many possibilities and many layers of meaning. These layers of connection and meaning were of crucial significance for the history of natural history. In recent decades, growing numbers of historians have begun to respond to this stimulus by exploring the deeper relations between correspondence and science. Many focus on the way that desk-bound scientists used letters to collect data for large-scale projects. Charles Darwin's been a very popular figure for attention, but others are perhaps even more important, such as anatomists and museum directors like Georges Cuvier or Richard Owen. The director of the Smithsonian Institution, Spencer Baird, or Joseph Hooker, the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in London during the middle years of the 19th century. The 600 letters that survive in the archives of Conrad Gesner, the, 17th, uh, the 16th century Swiss naturalist, reveal a republic of letters fluently connected by the then universal language of Latin. And Alexander von Humboldt, and I'm sorry, this is a terrible slide, taken off the web again. Alexander von Humboldt, seen here, or at least um, depicted here, in, in the Orinoco in 1803, in a highly romanticized image that bore little connection to the hardships of his expedition, collected data on a wide range of physical variables in South America. Yet it was mainly by augmenting his own observations with knowledge derived from other people in some tens of thousands of letters after his return to Europe. In his study, in his library, that Humboldt was able to reflect on how those variables related to one another throughout the cosmos. Humboldt's project was universality or universalism and he used letters in order to achieve that. Using letters as a research tool in this respect substantially increased the amount of information to which each naturalist had access, a sort of written accompaniment to the expanding boundaries of the developed world, or as historians have argued, a spreading out of the practices of Western science as pervasive in its own way as colonial extension. And I'll pick up on this point later. As Chip and other, others have emphasized, traveling naturalists depended very heavily on correspondence, both for their immediate safety and to keep in touch with the world of science back home. Because naturalists often traveled into rough country with only a small party of guides and local assistants, it was vital to make sure that someone else knew where they were and only sensible to make arrangements for specimens, 
and field notebooks to be sent back to intermediaries at intervals. A typical letter from Joseph Banks, who sailed with Captain Cook to the Southern Hemisphere and later became president of the Royal Society of London, or of Sir Hans Sloane, traveler in the West Indies and founder of the British Museum, might well have included a detailed account of his local itinerary, accompanied by provisional lists of species and habitat notes, and some instructions about when to expect a shipment or how to store materials until his return. Natural history specimens represented a huge investment of time, money, expertise, and luck, and also carried a naturalist's future in the balance. The act of writing a letter was the first crucial stage in bringing these objects to the attention of the larger world in which each traveler wished to make a name. One of the first steps in bringing nature indoors and turning it into science. For Carl Linnaeus, whose extraordinary correspondence uniting traveling botanists as far apart as Japan, South Africa, Colombia, and the Urals, for him, each communication might actually be the last. Few of Linnaeus' traveling apostles returned alive to Uppsala. So it seems clear that many, if not all, traveling naturalists made extensive efforts not to be isolated from the world of learning, to make sure that they kept in touch, that they kept sending written information back as well as the specimens which they were storing and periodically shipping. They needed to um, ensure that what they were experiencing and where they literally were needed to be out there somewhere else, that it wasn't just themselves alone. They deliberately located themselves in a network of contacts, both local and far away, who looked after finances, stored boxes of specimens, provided stop-off points, discussed itineraries, and indicated what museum-based collectors most wanted to have. Perhaps, like Alfred Russell Wallace, they entered into a long-term relationship with a commercial agent, such as Samuel Stevens, a natural history merchant in London, or were part of an institutional or government expedition whose protective arms extended far beyond the literal state, like the great French voyages of the late 18th century or the Lewis and Clark expedition commemorated this year. Or like Darwin, they may have had a special relationship with a former professor, such as John Stevens Henslow, Darwin's old botany professor. Henslow received the boxes that Darwin sent him from the Beagle voyage. He unpacked them, he checked the preservation of the specimens, wrote Darwin letters full of good advice, information, and support. He looked things up in catalogues for Darwin when he thought Darwin was wrong, and he reminded him to tie the label on the legs of the bird specimens, and asked him on at least one occasion, because he didn't get an answer the first time, what on earth was in packet 223? As Harry Lieberson has remarked, travelers in the field consequently encountered new forms of dependency that required the deft employment of, of a range of social skills as much as any practical natural history ability. Intellectual input from home had to be solicited and maintained. The discipline of a ship or overland expeditionary force was often oppressive and required a certain amount of maneuvering on the naturalist's part. Informants and guides had to be chosen carefully, and the demands of local leaders needed to be taken into account. Two years into their voyage around the world, Darwin, for example, had a heated argument with Captain Robert Fitzroy over slavery that made him think that he would have to leave the ship. And in fact, he did leave the ship for about four days, until they both managed to apologize and continue together. Diplomats, local merchants, and expatriate Europeans served as important contacts and staging posts, often making their specific knowledge available by letter to the international body of scientific travelers. <laughs> 
to examine the correspondence of one single traveling figure, therefore, paradoxically provides a strong sense of the multiple actors and the multiplicity of voices that were involved in any natural history collecting enterprise. Historians of biology have also noted the way that correspondence generated a forum in which the natural history sciences could actually be constructed. Whether naturalists were working in the field or in their studies, whether in a laboratory or a museum, the exchange of letters created, encouraged, I'm sorry, encouraged the creation of communities in which participating members either held specialized information or possessed skills that other members might need to draw upon in order to carry out his or her tasks. From at least the 17th century, people have sought advice by letter about the identification of specimens, corrected mistakes in books, discussed new publications, argued about priority, given advice, sold equipment, accepted patronage, offered gifts, and come to agreement on definitions. Overlapping circles of correspondence were common, as Emma Sparry has described, for botanists in pre-revolutionary France, who exchanged seeds and plant specimens by letter, sometimes as gifts, more often as part of a hard-driven bargain, two packets of rare seeds from William Bartram's garden in Philadelphia, perhaps, for a living specimen of the cedar of Lebanon, which in turn might be exchanged for a highly desirable set of herbarium sheets from Australia. Perhaps a particular technique, such as new developments in microscopy, might connect people by letter, as Mark Ratcliffe explains, for a group of European naturalists surrounding Abraham Tremblay. Tremblay sent his correspondence in the post little do-it-yourself kits, containing a few living polyps in a glass jar, along with some very delicate instruments and instructions on how to turn the polyp inside out, thereby encouraging other naturalists to replicate and authenticate his experiments to show the, the regenerative powers of these little animals. Without a microscope, in fact, the world of the very small was invisible to everybody, except through words and pictures. Descriptions needed to be trustworthy and standardized, and definitions a matter of consensus and communication, especially in this regard, visual standards. Ernst Haeckel's work, later in the, in, in the 19th century, later demonstrated how important it was for naturalists to agree on the stages in embryology, the denomination of cell divisions and issues of scale. These are questions of normalization in science, and I would like to propose that correspondence is contributing very extensively to that question. Or in the case of John James Audubon, a specific publishing project might be the link between correspondence, such as gathering subscribers for his magnificent but very expensive edition of The Birds of America. The rare book room here at the university has one of the very few complete copies left in existence. It's a real treasure that depended on the artist's social skills in fundraising and business management as much as his exceptional artistic talent. And with special regard to our meeting tomorrow, correspondence seems to have created a social space in which the boundaries of class, education, and gender could often be overcome, not always, but often. Particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, letters moved relatively freely between collectors, suppliers, students, academics, local naturalists, gardeners, trappers, overseas residents, shopkeepers, museum curators, amateurs, landowners, publishers, wealthy sponsors, illustrators, and so forth although these occupational niches were not always easily distinguishable. Women were included to some degree in these correspondence networks, especially natural history collectors, like Mary Anning, the collector of fossil reptiles at Lyme Regis on the south coast of England. 
or artists like Lucy Say, the wife of Thomas Say, the conchologist, who prepared all the illustrations for her husband's works, and after his death, was the first woman to be elected to a scientific society in the United States. Artisans were frequently praised as bearers of specialized local knowledge, as Anne Secord's studies of botanical correspondence between university experts and workmen at the cotton mills in Lancashire makes plain. To belong to a corresponding community was not only one of the chief ways of securing reliable knowledge about the natural world or making something about it known in an acceptable manner, but also a route for occasionally overcoming social divisions of class, occupation, and gender. Indeed, following appreciatively in the footsteps of those who study science in action, I'd like to argue that corresponding communities in themselves were significant agents in the creation of natural history knowledge, in which letters built up trust between individuals and provided ways to authenticate observations, evaluate books, create shared guidelines, and discuss theoretical proposals without the necessity of retracing someone's intellectual steps or visiting the Orinoco or Sydney Bay to see for oneself. This could be regarded as the documentary alternative to witnessing processes that Stephen Shapin has proposed as a key feature of 17th century science. Facts, as we're coming to understand, are rather complicated things that only emerge through discussion and maneuver and are subject to a sort of etiquette for choosing, handling, and agreeing reports about the way the natural world behaves. In previous centuries, letters ebbing and flowing between naturalists established what Martin Rudwick has elsewhere referred to as a semantic space. And lots of his friends have teased him about that expression. Semantic space, a cultural arena full of opportunities for communication in which issues of authentication and standardization could be considered and resolved, what might be called a location for the normalization of the language, behavior, and values of science. So letters are not only important documentary history, a precious resource for the extra dimension they add to our understanding, but also tell us much about the scientific enterprise. Well, where might Darwin fit into all this? There's some 14,000 items of his correspondence still in existence. That's to and from Darwin. Probably only two-thirds of what was actually written during his lifetime. And if one works it out just in relation to Darwin himself, it was probably about three letters a day for the whole of his working life, including Sundays and Christmas. And there's lots of letters that were written on Christmas Day, so one wonders quite why he found it necessary to retire into his study. Um, these were the basic materials for Darwin's work, as much as any laboratory notebook might have been for Louis Pasteur or Benjamin Franklin. He used letters to gather information, test his ideas, discuss books and articles, and to gauge the likely response to evolutionary reviews. He could carefully phrase a proposition about evolution and choose to whom he might send it and see what the reaction was. It's a very interesting way of gauging responses. He employed letters strategically to disarm opponents. And then, after The Origin of Species was published, he wrote courteously and persistently to an astonishing number of people to solicit support for his point of view. And in turn, people from all over the globe asked for explanations of particular points in The Origin of Species and his subsequent books. They offered abuse or plaudits, mostly abuse, discussed God and primeval ooze, and volunteered their own curious facts to add to his proposals. 
And admittedly, for much of this time, Darwin was ill and preferred to stay at home working in his study. The freewheeling, traveling stage of his life ended in the 1930s when the Beagle returned to Britain, after which he turned, as it were, into a barnacle, settling down on his rock, putting up a protective carapace, never to move again. He found letters essential to keep abreast of the latest scientific research and to pursue his own projects effectively. If you've chosen to stick yourself in one place, and his house was some 15 miles outside central London, in those days really very rural, very uh, separate, he found the letters were the only way of keeping in touch, absolutely essential to him. And Darwin's intellectual achievement appears to me, in fact, just as much a product of the Victorian Postal Service as it was the brainchild of a gifted and somewhat reclusive invalid. Such a life, such a life obviously depended on the postal system, the preeminent collective enterprise of the 19th century. No one would believe the number of letters surging across Britain, said Roland Hill, the inventor of the penny postal system. By mid-century, 600 million letters were dispatched in Britain every year. 68 million letters moved around London alone, requiring 11 deliveries a day. Someone writing a letter in the morning might reasonably expect an answer before the end of the afternoon. Such rapidity of communication, the 19th century equivalent of our own communication revolution, led to the contents of letters becoming more informal more up-to-date, more personal, and more frequent, pulling the edges of the literate world together. The actual content changes because of the um, rapidity of communication, something that many commentators are saying about our email communication today. Greater geographic mobility of individuals and the national and international scope of their activities meant that there were also more reasons for people to communicate. There appeared to be more going on. Moreover, there were few viable alternatives. The electric telegraph in the 1840s and telephones in the 1880s were very expensive, impractical for lengthy discussions and used much less frequently than letters. So Darwin lived his life through his correspondence. Everyone obeyed the advice given by a family poet, remarked one of his granddaughters. Write a letter, write a letter. Good advice will make us better. Father, mother, sister, brother, let us all advise each other. So drawing on this correspondence, it's possible to consider Darwin himself as a master strategist, organizing his contacts into a flexible intellectual movement held together of course, by personal commitment to evolutionary theory, and because they mostly knew and liked Darwin, um, held together by publications, reviews, friendship, and controversy, almost an invisible college kept in momentum by one man writing letters in his study. Darwin's study at Down House in Kent. You'll hate the very sight of my handwriting, Darwin told one of his inner circle in 1855, but I will ask for nothing more, at least for a long time. The promise was always broken. His study became what Bruno Latour calls a center of administration and calculation, in which Darwin churned out requests for information and processed answers, kept himself at the leading edge of contemporary science, ensured that his book was being read and reviewed, and that his theory was constantly refined and improved. To his credit, he kept his own research moving forwards, taking up fresh topics and revising the old throughout the uh, remaining years of his life, each new subject being accompanied by another burst of letters. If there was any single factor that characterized the heart of his scientific undertaking, it was this systematic use of correspondence networks. Mostly, he used his contacts to establish what he would regard as trustworthy evidence, 
He carried on an extensive interchange with a wide variety of people, dog breeders, cattle owners, pigeon fanciers, zookeepers and gardeners, as well as the expert museum curators that we would expect, the systematists, the professors of zoology, geology, and botany, experimental naturalists, and relatives on both sides of the family. Customarily, everything that emerged in his research was checked with three or four more correspondents. Darwin didn't always govern the content or direction of the flow of information in this respect. He wrote as an equal to his close friends, Joseph Hooker, Thomas Henry Huxley, John Lubbock, and the rest, and as a supplicant to those people who held a very much greater store of expert knowledge, such as Alexander von Humboldt. Yet contemporary industrialized traditions in Britain of the division of labor, the social hierarchies, encouraged him also to appropriate specialized information from other less well-known or socially inferior individuals. John Thackeray and Jacob Gruber indicated some years ago that unequal power relations existed very obviously between Richard Owen, the superintendent of the Natural History Museum in London, and his network of natural history correspondents. The same might be said for Charles Lyell and his army of geological informants, many of whom actually were rather critical about being suddenly finding themselves in his books. Intellectual negotiation, appropriation, and synthesis took place, even though the material might have been discovered, owned, and even described by someone else. So letters for Darwin were a way to add extra value to the initial observation, somehow making the knowledge the scientists own. There was nothing collective in that enterprise. Collectivity is a feature of science that Robert Kohler has specifically noted as a characteristic of modern, modern laboratory-based research. Darwin's work was entirely individualistic, although nevertheless it was based on a very large um, communication circle. Darwin's desire for completeness takes the reader into many strange corners of Victorian life. On this day, on the 10th of November, in 1832, for example, Darwin wrote home from the Beagle's mooring in Montevideo to say that he feared the French collector, Alcide d'Aubigny, would take the cream of all specimens before him. In November 1855, he was back, of course, he was sending out inquiries about hollyhocks to his relatives. In November 1859, he was waiting for The Origin of Species to be published in an agony of apprehension. In November 1871, he was wondering about the movement of animals' ears. And 10 years later, was frantic, he told his son, about the number of letters he was receiving about worms. Every theme, every idea was explored with a circle of other people. When thinking about the structure of bee cells, for example, and how to establish that the hexagonal shape was a function of the bee's innate behavior patterns and not the result of God's design, he obviously discussed geometry with an architect who was building an extension to the family home. We had a plum pudding for dinner, he told the architect, very excitedly in September 1865, and from the cook having hit exactly the right tenacity and thickness of the pastry crust, it came up a complete sphere mapped out with hexagonal articulations, and the plums had laid the foundation without any instinctive knowledge of a regular hexagonal comb. It's such a pity he didn't use that, isn't it? It seems useful to consider these features of correspondence as paralleling 19th century colonial organization and its accompanying world of bureaucracy. 
large-scale letter projects tended to be initiated by men involved in government business that in turn rested on colonial structures, such as John Herschel, whose extant correspondence about astronomical phenomena ran to more than 10,000 letters at the Royal Society alone. Or connected with institutional centers, such as William and Joseph Hooker at the Botanic Gardens at Kew, whose letter books with botanists across the globe have hardly yet been explored. Darwin's encounter with the British Admiralty similarly showed him how data collection on the grand scale could be done. My examples are British, but obviously were repeated all over the developed world. Managed institutional correspondence like this, of course, began much earlier, as evidenced by the activities of Henry Oldenburg or James Durin, successive foreign secretaries of the Royal Society of London in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, or the corresponding members of the Académie des Sciences in Paris, or the American Philosophical Society, whose role was explicitly to keep the fellows informed about contemporary developments. The connection between colonial motifs and science has a long and stimulating history to which I think we should perhaps add correspondence networks echoing imperial structures to the advantage of those figures or institutions that lay at the center. And as Ted Porter has shown, the rise of respectable society through the 18th and 19th centuries was accompanied by a proliferation of financial, economic, and statistical procedures. On the one hand, standardizing banking and investment practices, and on the other, reflecting the increasing diversification and sophistication of government organization. An efficient bureaucrat wrote directives, kept copies, filed papers, maintained many lines of inquiry, and with luck was eventually able to distill a wide variety of information into a lucid report. This aspect of bureaucracy can be recognized in the work of many natural scientists. In fact, the imagery of a bank, a financial bank, or other kind of institution is quite useful here as a place where information is ordered and processed, shared codes of etiquette are established, the interchangeability and comparison of forms of information is supervised, and handling and display is subject to constant review. It somewhat spoils the picturesque image of the traveling naturalist to turn him or her into a bureaucrat. Yet I suggest there is possibly room to acknowledge efficiency as well as the individual figure alone with nature exploring and reaching a deeper understanding through direct connection with animals, plants, and rocks. Tomorrow, we hold a conference that will dwell on the activities of traveling naturalists. Every time one of those collectors picked up a plant, an, an animal, or a rock, or shot a bird, the scientific process was already beginning to transform a natural object into a thing for analysis, soon to be named, compared with others, described in print, sometimes beautifully pictured, perhaps argued over, like the mummified ibis from Napoleon's campaign in Egypt that Chip told us about a few years ago, or exchanged as items of great rarity or national pride to be displayed in the famous museums of the world. Today, I've spoken about one small part of that process, the communication networks that helped naturalists locate themselves and their objects and their ideas within contemporary scientific society. At a recent um, rather large history of science meeting in Halifax, Jim Secord from the University of Cambridge spoke of knowledge not just as a set of abstract doctrines, but also as a communicative practice within a range of well-integrated and flexible settings. <laughs> 
by thinking about the processes of circulating information, here in letters, tomorrow in specimens, we have a way to move forward beyond the inherited stories about the way science has been conducted to new accounts that bind the work to the conditions of its production. A close study of natural history and context brings science down to earth, locating it in specific times and places. In a few words from the preface to Chip's recent book on animal behavior, concepts, practices, people and places intertwine dynamically in the scientific enterprise. We're very familiar with the theme of knowledge as practice. Now it seems we might turn to examine scientific knowledge as communication. Thank you very much. It's fascinating to read these letters, and it's, they provide a wonderful basis for understanding the context of the development of science. Um, what are scientific historians going to do about our era and the next era since mm. letter writing is lost and emails are only saved by the national security agencies? We're going to lose a huge amount. I think you should all be busy writing diaries at this moment because we, we won't have this unless people, are, I mean, I don't save mine in any particular order and I'm sure, perhaps, feel fairly confident that you don't. But um, we will have nothing of that first layer of interaction. We will, as, as future historians, will look back on our era and see perhaps seminar papers and records of discussions from the process, intervening in the process slightly later than we can now, we're going to lose an awful lot. Yes. Yes. I just need to repeat your question, if you don't mind, because this is being recorded. Um, you've asked a very interesting question about whether those people who were invited to supply information ever felt reticent because that information was almost immediately going to be sent out to someone else to be checked. It's like the New Yorker, what one imagines the New Yorker is like. Um, many of the figures that Darwin was writing to didn't know each other so that he could uh, arrange who he would send the information to. So uh, a usual trajectory would be that he would pick up a piece of information from a dog breeder, dog handler, and think to himself, well, that's very interesting. He would ask a couple of relatives the next time he went round for dinner. He would then ask um, one or two of his friends, Lyle, Wallace, or Joseph Hooker, depending on what the information was. So there's always at least three stages in checking that information. Mm -hmm. 
people seem to be immensely keen to give him information. And that's one thing that has always puzzled those, those of us who work on the Darwin correspondence, is how willing people were to give up their life's work to this man. And they were for the most part thanked. They were often thanked very generously. But I think during the middle years of the 19th century, the notion of ownership of scientific ideas was still being negotiated, that it wasn't quite as fixed as it is now. If you wouldn't mind, we would appreciate your assistance. We do have a handheld mic here, and we really want to get each of the questions recorded on the videotape. If we could pass these to the person as their hands are raised, and then if you would pass it to the next person, um, we appreciate all of your help in getting it sent from one person to another. Thank you. Okay. There's one right at the back there. Yes. I'm, I'm intrigued by, I think you mentioned Linnaeus had many correspondents mm -hmm. who never came back. And I wonder if you could address the issue of, uh, rather than those people who were in civilized centers where correspondents could be answered rather quickly, what were some of the issues connected with those people who were very, very far and in remote places and the kinds of interchanges or lack of interchanges that occurred when someone mailed something one way or the other and didn't get a response for months on end. Yes. It's astonishing how quickly letters did go around the globe. A letter from London to Singapore could on occasion take two months, which I think is pretty rapid for the middle years of the 19th century. Where it went after Singapore, might then take another two months, it's not entirely clear. When Alfred Russell Wallace, for example, was out in some of the smaller islands, a letter between him and Darwin could take four months. But we know from what Wallace, how Wallace describes the process that the last leg often was by um, dugout canoe, or pr praha. So the Main connections, if they were on a steamship connection, well, perhaps not steamship at those days, but uh, on a sailing ship connection, on a packet line, were really rather remarkably fast. Linnaeus was writing to his apostles a hundred years earlier. It did take a long time for a letter to go from Stockholm to, let's say, Japan, where one of his apostles was working. But one could expect a letter to get there. Actually, I'm telling a lie. There's a very well-known letter from the Galapagos Islands. Darwin wrote a letter from the Galapagos Islands whilst he was there. That never arrived, never got back to Britain, so it must have gone down in some ship on the way. But that's the only instance I know of when a letter that Darwin wrote from the Beagle voyage, didn't get back to his family in Shropshire. Janet, can you say something about um, the way in which Darwin's letter writing practices might have changed from the time, say, that he was on the Beagle right toward the end of his life? Do you detect any noticeable differences? That's one question. And another question is, uh, when answering a correspondent, do you find uh, distinctive differences when he's uh, answering, say, someone whom he knows on the one hand rather intimately, or perhaps someone of fairly high scientific status, as opposed to one of his correspondents whom he may only know in the vaguest sort of way, uh, or someone who he didn't know at all? Mm. Thank you, Bob. There is a change over his life in the way that he deals with the information that he wishes to convey in letters. On the Beagle Voyage, as I hoped I was suggesting tonight, he had a lot of things he needed to tell people and it was the, the letters served as a record of what he was doing, um, not only of his emotions, but actually where he had been, how much money he had spent, what he had collected. They served as a rather extensive and lengthy interim account, one every month 
for five years. He doesn't write letters like that ever again. He does write very careful letters explaining his ideas and was always remarkably courteous. I think if I received three letters a day and had to respond to them, I would get very brief. But he, he really tries to answer the letters. Occasionally, towards the end of his life, he asked his son to answer for him. His son would take dictation. And the, this son, Francis, said that his father was always rather reluctant to let him do it because Charles Darwin thought the son didn't do the courtesies well enough. So there was a very strong sense that he should be polite. And lots of his correspondence reflected on that after his death and said that he was a perfectly charming man, that they loved to correspond with him. Uh, there is, or one can see in retrospect, looking through the correspondence, a particularly oily manner when he's addressing a lord. <laughs> <laughs> so for all his social democrat democratic nature, for all his belief in equality and liberalism, he still felt that old British... Um, sense of admiration and he gets into terrific tangles of how to end a letter to a lord. <laughs> so, he should have had a few German phrases. Yes. My question would ask for your comments about the way in which correspondence has a particular congruence to the nature of the knowledge being transmitted. It strikes me that in a situation such as Darwin's, where he was very much dependent upon an accumulation of a vast array of sometimes disparate facts, that correspondence served him very well as a way of collecting those facts because they could be reduced to something that could be put into a, a paragraph or even a sentence. Uh, whereas in other areas of science, correspondence may not have served uh, that well to communicate ideas. I'm thinking, for example, of the way in which uh, in the late 17th century, Newton was very uh, frustrated often at the way in which he seemed not to be able to, to communicate exactly what he wanted in his correspondence with the Royal Society. Would you say something about this linkage between content and form in correspondence? Well, I think you've hit the nail exactly on the head, that there's something particularly about natural history that's conducive to large data-collecting correspondence exercises, or perhaps it's particularly 19th century because the astronomical observations, the people working on the tides, for instance, all the, what you call the natural historical observational sciences seem to have a particular affinity for these big um, networks where information is rather discreet and can be accumulated. There are instances in Darwin's correspondence, and I'm sorry to harp on about Darwin, but he does discuss ideas. He has a very extended conversation by letter over several years with Alfred Russell Wallace about um, the color, protective coloration of birds, for example, about the um, biological status of humans as well. These are, and, and these are difficult issues. And, they're often prefaced by remarks with Darwin saying, I don't think I'm quite going to say this right, but here is what I'm going to say. And then the next four or five letters were uh, sort of backtracking and expanding and qualifying. So there were these discussions, but you're perfectly, you're absolutely right. They're not talking maths, that they're not trying to convey 
very complex issues about the origin of the universe, for example. They talk about God, which is difficult enough, but they, they discuss it in words that you and I would understand. They're, so, yes, I would think there's a close connection between the form and the content, and I would like to make a stand on that, that perhaps letters are not very useful for some kinds of science, but the sort of science I'm studying, they're extraordinarily important. Thank you. If I might expand on that, and the nature of the scientific enterprise, could you say something, please, in relation to that other great Darwin project, which would be his notebooks, and the content and form relationship that you might find there with, with what is individual and private is it the real or Darwin in the notebook? And what is collective and public? Is that more true to science in the letters? Well, public and private are always very difficult concepts. Uh, the notebooks were meant to be private, and that's perfectly clear. They have a difficult relationship to what we might hope to reconstruct from Darwin's thought because it's so easy to take that as a statement of what he believed, those remarks in the notebooks. When the ideas come tumbling out and their interjections and um, perhaps not even consecutively laid out on the page, it's so tempting to take that as some real representation of what, what he was thinking. But for all we know, he could have been writing it down, copying it out from some book, or it could be something somebody said. So no matter how much scholarship goes into tracking down the sources of the information, we, we always reach some level of uncertainty with those notebooks. But we do know they were private. Now they're extremely public. And that distorts, I think, I mean, of course, I wouldn't suggest that we should not read them, or make use of them, but it distorts Darwin's view of himself. And we do not get a, an accurate picture of what Darwin must have been like in his own day, because they were private. It's the same with some of the visual images of Darwin. There's a very famous picture of him just after he came back from the Beagle voyage, a very fresh-faced young man in a checked coat. Um, nobody saw it. It was done for the family. It hung in the family home. And the only people who saw it were relatives and guests. But it's the image we all think of as Darwin. So there are very interesting issues that you're raising here about the relationship between public and private. Janet, how often were the letters accompanied by objects? by species or other objects that were being sent from one naturalist to another. And within that class of objects were some of those objects gifts that bound together naturalists in a particular way. There are lots of objects, obviously small objects, that go with le letters. Bigger ones go in packets, and as far as we know, don't have an in, a, a letter enclosing them. The, the, the author of a letter, of a, or the giver of a gift, would say, I have sent by yes, yesterday's post a package for you. So they don't come together unless it's a small object that can be folded up in the letter. All kinds of things are sent. If one simply sticks with Darwin, he had... Still, in the archive in Cambridge, there are boxes that you don't get when you call for the archive materials. But associated with each box of letters, there is a box in the back that has the stuff. So if, Dar if whichever correspondent says to Darwin, I enclose some beans that have grown on the wrong side of the pod, you can find the beans if you wish. So there are things going back and forth, yes, and that must surely happen with all corresponding naturalists, perhaps less so when they're very far away, when there's a big distance between the two people 
the sender and recipient. Feathers, perhaps, might go. Drawings, certainly. Drawings as substitute specimens are a very common thing to find in letters. Essential, actually. But specimens of rocks are far less likely to be found. And gifts, you ask about. Yes, the gift exchange has been looked at by a number of scientists with anthropological leanings who are extremely interested in what's going on there. And the gift can make relations smoother. They can ingratiate and generate patronage, as we would all easily understand. But they can also lift the giver over other kinds of barriers. And there's a very nice study that's been performed on artisan naturalists, working men who gather in pubs in Britain and discuss plants. And they name them in Latin and write to well-known expert botanists enclosing the specimens and giving it the Latin name. And it's absolutely crucial to them that they give it the Latin name, that they're participating in the culture that they see surrounding these plants. Um, one of the things that I think your presentation uh, opens up for question is the story that we've had that uh, writers of the early 17th century, like Mersenne, for example, um, who served as uh, locuses of letter writing networks, um, but also were the location where the debate was taking place. The letter writing network was the actual scientific debate. There was no outside um, journal where uh, theories were debated and published. He's got you know, people, Gassendi, uh, Descartes writing to him and he's sharing information and the conversation is actually moving forward through him and through the letter writing. And then, so our story went, we get journals and scientific societies, and the letter writing isn't so significant anymore. It sounds like uh, we need to rethink that now. Um, and my question is, how long do you think that remains as a really significant um, place for actual knowledge production? Not just collecting data, not just uh, publicity, mm -hmm. not just vetting ideas, uh, but the actual locus of the debate, which it sounds like didn't go away right away. Does it extend to Darwin, uh, or when would you say it stops? Well, I'd like to suggest that it, to some degree, continues today. That letter writing is a substitute for talk, and people talk. Still, they talk. Of course, they might telephone and email, but they they talk, and that's what the letters are enabling scientists to do. We've just been discussing a little earlier that that layer of interaction is presumably on its way out with the electronic revolution. I don't know how that will be recorded any further. But we even still have a tradition that surely is very strange of communicating scientific results in letters to such and such a journal. And that remains, doesn't it? And that's left over from the scientific revolution, that when the letter was, was the knowledge. I'm going to take advantage of the proximity. Um, so sort of following up on that, how are the letters being part of the work that he's doing? You talk about 14,000 letters, and I don't know what proportion of those are things that he has in his study, but so that he has a huge filing cabinet, and he's organizing them, and he, you know, how is he using them for his work? He's tearing them up yeah. and only keeping the bits that he thinks are useful. And they're being filed in fo folders or boxes or shelves according to with what, what they relate to, embryology, abortive organs, uh, stripes on donkeys, things like that. And 
you can see it more clearly with Darwin than with anyone else, so I'm not sure whether I'm talking about an exceptional case. But the information that comes through a large proportion of the correspondence before he writes The Origin of Species turns up in The Origin of Species, and it turns up in the form of a personal statement such as, I received a letter from Sir John Seabright who says that he can make any pigeon he fancies. So they're in that book as letters, and they gain a certain amount of their authoritativeness from the fact that they're a letter, a named letter is there, and that anybody can go back and check. So it's an illusion of trustworthiness, but it's nevertheless an invitation to trust him that he has researched this. Of course, there are other ways of researching it, but he includes the correspondence as well. Well, I think we've done letters, didn't you? <laughs>